two, one. Welcome to a new program called Anglican 2020, and this is called 10-Minute Topic. I've been requested many times to keep up with the 10-Minute Topic. We did like three or four episodes a couple years ago, and in this day and age, people only have like 10 minutes to listen to something important. But when I say 10-Minute Topic, I'm not going to hold my my guests to 10 minutes. Uh, and when you get something like... Matt Kennedy, who's very vibrant with his words and uh, he knows it really well, it could go 40 minutes. But we're <laughs> and here's the big thing, Matt. I don't want to let anybody in your church know you can do something like this in 10 minutes. That's, that's, that's dangerous. <laughs> that's, wait a minute, what's the 45 minutes, man? But uh, people, <laughs> this is Matt Kennedy from Stan Firm, and he's also um, a rector up in what's the town called? Binghamton, New York. Binghamton, New York. Yep, uh, my uh, my priest is from Binghamton, uh, uh, Brian Murphy, and uh, so got a little connection oh, there. I, yeah. I actually his his brother is in my parish. So really, oh gosh, this small world. Yeah. So uh, I thought we'd get together. You know, there's no intro here. We're just doing this for the first time. This is episode one of Anglican 2020. Oh, it's really cool, Kevin. 2020. You're, yeah, I'm doing that one. Yeah, it's the vision thing. <laughs> Ten minute topic. Now, Matt, I follow on Facebook and on Stand Firm and elsewhere, and Matt and I agree on President Trump as being a person of not high moral character. I, you can nod. Yes, Kevin, yeah. I agree. <laughs> I, I have a question about that. Right? And uh, I did not vote for Trump, but uh, he's in office now, and. Once he's in office, we as Christians have a different responsibility than somebody who's campaigning for office. Uh, and as such, I want to take us back, big picture here, the Old Testament and New Testament and all of church history had no idea of a democracy. That wasn't part of anybody's thinking back then. And I want to talk a little bit about Romans 13, which calls us to uh, be uh, subjected to authorities people like Trump or the US government or the King of England or the Queen of England, the authorities above us to some extent. And I thought we could talk a little bit about that because it certainly applies to the times now, whether it's here or whether it's uh, in the Middle East or elsewhere, what kind of range does Romans 13 have on the Christian uh, life? Well, it seems pretty, pretty all encompassing. I and mean, if you read the text, uh, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. That's an all-encompassing statement. Every every authority figure is there because of God's sovereign will. Yes, there were elections in the United States. Yes, there were other rulers coming to power in different ways all around the world. But regardless, however those systems work, God is the, is the one who's sovereign over all of them, and no one would be, uh, well, no one would have any power or authority had God not put him there. So, what that means about for, with, with regard to the Christian is, since God put this man or this woman in play, we we should treat that person as God's appointed representative, and a disobedient disobedience or or disrespect for the person in authority is disrespect for God. You're on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. Facebook is divided by two people, those who love Trump too much and those who hate Trump too much. You know, it, yeah. it's it's interesting. I sit back and I didn't vote for him because in my mind I was given the choice between Nero and Caligula. Um, <laughs> as far as uh, Kevin, go to the polls, vote for this clown or that clown uh, to be your leader. And I just couldn't do it. I remember right. taking my son with me for his first time going to the polling. And he was excited about Trump because it was something new. And he certainly didn't like right. what he had. And he goes, Dad, are you going to circle Trump? I, I can't do it, Ben. I, can't. I, as a Christian, can't vote for him. However, yeah. if he becomes our leader or Hillary becomes our leader, I am subject to their authorities. Right. No, I remember the I remember the, the internal debate I had with myself. That I remember back in the '90s when Bill Clinton was um, being impeached, and you know the, the the mantra at that 
point from the conservative side was, look, uh, character matters, right? So um, if he's if he's going to lie to his wife, he's going to lie to the, the nation. We can't have a man who's a liar in in office, and that that kind of determined my vote. I, I can't I can't vote, but last time, but you're right. Now that he's our president, he's he's owes he's owed our respect and our submission to his uh, to his authority. Um, and you know, at the same at the same time. So I think the calculus changes a little bit coming into 2020 um, because now he has a record of, of being of having governed um, and there's no not that I know of anyway maybe I'm, I'm wrong I don't think something will come up in in the news but there's no sex scandal or or any any charge I'm aware of as immorality in office um, so I do think the calculus changes a little bit coming up to this next election it might be more uh, more reasonable for someone to you know hold a nose and say, okay, I'd rather have President Trump than President whoever um, in this case. Well, in this case, President Trump has been a clean uh, slate to the federal judiciary. Um, he even made the the federal circuit ninth court uh, not conservative, but it's going to be there soon. He has brought abortion to a level playing f uh, field. For the last uh, 12 years, uh, to be pro-life was to have no advantage at all in legal standing or government standing. Uh, that has been changed. There has been good under the Trump administration if you're a Christian. Absolutely. And yeah. How about that? From an evil guy. Now, let's play uh, devil's advocate here. Uh, we as Americans are on this ground and free because of a revolution. Did those revolutionaries follow Romans 13? Where does, you know, Romans 13 f fall in line for people who say the government has gone too far and it's time to uh, take back authority and take back power? That's a great question and one that there's a lot of, you know, still a lot of debate about. Yeah, you know, I, I were I living back in the revolutionary period, well, a lot of Anglicans turned out to be loyalists because uh, the Church of England. And mm -hmm. um, in fact, that's one of the reasons why we changed our name to the Episcopal Church after the after the revolution to uh, disassociate from uh, the Church of England. But um, I think there were there's one question: is where does your primary ro loyalty lie? If you're a colonist, does it lie primarily with the king, or 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 does it lie primarily with your governor? Is is, is, is the local authority the one you submit to, or or the the kingdom authority? And people fell down on different sides of that. And uh, they're trying to apply Romans 13 to both of those. Which way do we go? Now, uh, clearly, um, the choice is already made for us. So we're in the uh, United States, and I wouldn't suggest breaking off and going back to <laughs> going, going back to England. But um, We're sorry. But <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So we have, to, we have to kind of deal with the cars we've been dealt, or the cars we've been dealt. Um, and, and going forward... Um, given the fact that we have now a Republican government um, led by uh, a, an executive branch and Mr. Trump is the, is the president, uh, we owe him the same kind of uh, uh, submission and respect that the scriptures call for. And also this brings up kind of the, the what we saw in the 1960s with the Civil Rights Movement. They were under the authority, but they said, listen, it's not working right. And Martin Luther King Jr. said, let's try doing this peacefully. We're not going to overthrow. We're not going to have a revolution like what was successful before. But we're going to attempt to change minds through a peaceful revolution. And I think they did the model of uh, Romans 13 by still being under authority, but saying we can change the people's minds in a democracy. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 there's several examples in scripture for for peaceful respectful disobedience so it's interesting in romans chapter 13 paul says be subject to those in authority but he, he avoids the word obedience which which seems to imply more of a, a stance of respect and a stance of, of, of obedience but with the recognition that that the civil government doesn't have all encompassing authority that as God does, their authority rests on God's appointment, but they don't have the same kind of um, universal appointment uh, authority that God does. So you have two examples in the scriptures you, you can go to. Daniel 
uh, told mm-hmm. not to pray to any other god, what, what does he do? The first thing he does, he goes and he opens the window and prays so everyone can see him pray. Civil disobedience because because Darius's commands ran contrary to God, and so he had to follow God on command. And the same thing you see in, in Acts chapter 5, when uh, the Sanhedrin tell Peter and John, we command you not to preach anymore in the name of Christ, and they said, yeah, I'm sorry, we, we we will obey God and not and not man. So when, when the government or any ruling authority commands you to, to, to do what God forbids, or forbids you to do what God commands, the Christian has no choice but to to disobey, but and the trick is to do so in a way that's respectful, like the civil rights movement, uh, respectful and uh, communicates not revolution but obedience to a higher authority. Yeah, it's hard to believe Romans thirteen was written by a person uh, who spent much of his uh, adult time in jail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You... <laughs> Nero was emperor when Romans thirteen was 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 written. Uh, not not the best model of the government so. no not at all and so if somebody from your parish you know who really hated trump or really loved trump ask you for your advice what to do now uh certainly the prayer book gives us a little flavor that we pray for them but uh what is the response we give to our congregations in uh, respect to uh, a person like donald trump who is flawed in many ways uh, in many fathoms, and it's it is just like watching some episode of some strange TV show uh, where someone's going to get fired. So, right? No, I mean, I think I think we can't. Of course, we can't tell our parishioners how how to vote. We can say right. certain things before. Sure. I mean, I would, you know, I I personally would would suggest not voting for any candidate who is promoting abortion or supporting abortion in any way, whether they're Republican or Democrat. Um, and I would say the same thing about um, about gay marriage. But, you know, we have both. Well, what happens if both of them do, which I think we're going to have that case coming up in the next election. Mm-hmm. Um, but so I would say at least for some issues are just getting a candidate off the table. Um, in this case, I think I'd probably say, look, uh, you your vote is an act of governance. You stand before God. In a, especially in a Republican form of government, and you're responsible for him for how you, how you vote. You want to use your vote in a way that's in, that's inconsistent is is consistent with his with his principles. And some of my parishioners, no doubt, are going to weigh the weigh those uh, those things and say, "Well, look, I don't necessarily love Trump, but I know that he's he's done more for the pro life cause than any Democratic candidate would or or will." So I'm. I'm going, to, I'm going to vote for Trump, and that's fine. I know there are also people in my in my parish who are, just won't vote for anybody until we get better candidates. And I don't. I, I'm not of the opinion that one has to vote. I think it's that's that's a that's maybe a civic. Um, it's, a, it's a civic, uh, popular idea, but there's no biblical mandate to do that. And I wouldn't want to tell a person that he had to or she had to if they didn't feel I couldn't do conscience. Yeah, I mean, as long as the other side is putting up candidates that nobody would vote for as well, you know, this becomes just one of the yeah. strangest times in history. Right. Matt, right. you're not going to believe it, but we, we've come in at 10 minutes here. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so I want to thank you to, I, I'm glad you were the first person on, on our 10 minute topic as, as we, we shoot this. Uh, what I plan to do is put up at least uh, two. Uh, 10 minute topics a week with people like Matt and other people around uh, the communion uh, or not we don't have to be Anglicans I don't suppose but if you have somebody you want to hear from or a topic you want to hear from send me an email at Anglican TV and we're going to put up these little 10 minute tidbits of information that you can use from wisdom like people like Matt Kennedy from Stanford 